Howdy folks, John here from rchelicopterfun.com. Welcome to part one in my little soldering series. Uh, the majority of the series is going to be going over how to solder RC connectors, but before we do any of that, we kind of have to look at soldering equipment. If you've already got soldering equipment, great, but I'm just going to be showing you some basic stuff that uh, you might want to get if you're brand new to this, give you some ideas of what's out there. This video is basically meant to augment my RC soldering page on my website, which goes into a lot more detail. So I will link to, to that below in the description and also up in the little card doodad. So the first thing we're going to be going over is the actual stuff that heats up. The soldering irons, guns, whatever. We'll start over on the right here. My main go-to soldering tool is this Aoyu uh, 968A Plus soldering station. More than most hobbyists would need, this is actually a combination unit. It's a hot air rework station for SMD work for component level repair, but it also works great for, you know, heat shrink tube work when I'm doing RC wiring and connectors. And then of course, it's also got a soldering iron. This is a 70 watt iron, which is a good power for most RC soldering. It'll do up to 12 gauge easy, 10 gauge if you're really pushing it. You really have to pump the heat up and just max out the heat. What's nice about this soldering station is it's also got a fume extractor. That's what this wand is. It will draw the fumes and the rosin smoke or flux smoke off the tip. Certainly more than most people would need when they're starting out. Which brings us to more common stuff that you will normally see. May as well start with the soldering gun because a lot of people already have one of these. This is the Weller 8200. It's been replaced by the, I believe it's the 9400. These are really powerful. They're not that expensive. You've got two levels of heat control selected by this trigger. The first is 100 watts of power. Second is 140. And these will do huge wiring. I've done all the way up to six gauge with this. Pushes out tons of heat. The problem with them though, is you can't do fine circuit board work. So if you want to do any PCB or circuit board work, these are not the best choice. Uh, that's where the irons are a lot better. And then another, oh, and the other problem with these, the tips wear out quite quickly. There's a copper heating element, and when tin and copper get together, the tin basically eats away at the tip. So does the flux, and they usually they usually break down at the bottom here because that's usually where the solder will pool. And the tips, obviously you can get replacements, so that's no big deal. They are kind of expensive though. What I have done over the years, I've made many of these. I just use copper, uh, solid copper wire. This is just from house wiring. This is actually 12 gauge. And I just bend it into the shape of the heating element. These won't last as long as the actual Weller ones, but they work great in an emergency. The next little guy on here is, I just did a review on this. I'll actually link to that too. I'll put it up in the little card and down below. This is the TS100 soldering iron. This is a very portable soldering iron. You can power it from any 12 to 24 volt DC power source. These are taking our hobby by storm. So many people are using them and they are wonderful tools. They use the new integrated tip technology. So the sensor and the heating element is built right into the tip. So you get really good thermal efficiency and very accurate heat control. Wonderful tools. And this thing, as we saw in the video, you can push this all the way to do eight gauge wire. So super powerful in such a small package. It's rated at 65 watts. And then last up is one that a lot of people have probably seen in the hobby shops and whatnot. This is the Weller WLC 100. It's a 40 watt, so it's pretty limiting. You might get 12 gauge with it. 14 gauge though is pretty much where I find they max out. But you might get 12. It does have, it's, this isn't heat control, it's more or less a, it's a wattage control. So kind of like the two trigger gun, only you've got a variable rheostat on here controlling the wattage. But not a bad little unit for the price, however, for not much more, you could get you know, one of these, or even a clone T12 soldering station. I talk about all that in my the soldering page on my site. I may as well talk about tips. So with the soldering irons, whether you get 
You know, these type, these have a really quick interchangeable tip. And the soldering iron, these are a T18 tip. You slide over a heating element on the soldering iron. You generally want, you know, a few of these depending on what you're doing for RC wiring work and connectors. I like a nice wedge tip. It's got more thermal mass, more surface area to conduct heat, a little more thermally efficient. And then for, you know, circuit board work, you, know, you can use a conical tip. Not the best. Actually, that's a wedge. But there's a conical tip. Problem with these is they, they taper down to such a small size. There is heat loss in there. It doesn't, uh, the heat doesn't readily migrate to the tip, but they work, okay? Uh, there's also bevel tips. That's what most people use for circuit board work, most professionals. But a conical will get you by. Very important to keep the tips clean. Your tips will last a long, long time. You know, I've had this, this station for, oh, four or five years. And all my tips are still fine. I just keep them clean. This is a good example now. And to clean the tips, never ever sand them or file them. No harsh mechanical cleaning. These, the end of the tip is coated in an iron to protect the copper core from the solder. Solder, the tin will eat away at the copper. So you've got this protective coating of iron on the tip. And if you remove that, you expose the bare copper, tip shot. Uh, as far as how to clean them when they are up to temperature, the best method is uh, these brass shavings. This will keep the tips very clean. It's safe for them. And all the other big benefit with those is they don't draw too much heat out of the tip when you do clean them. The other option, of course, are the sponges that come with most soldering stations. As we saw with this and this little guy here. And these are just a cellulose sponge. You dampen them up before you use them and the drawback with that is as you're passing the uh, iron through you're you're pulling a lot of heat out of the tip so most people don't really like using sponges I find I use them at the end I'll use this one while I'm soldering but then before I put the gun away or turn it off the iron I will clean it with the sponge because it really does do a good job of cleaning all the solder and mainly the rosin off of the tip and these are quite expensive if you have to buy them from an electronic shop. All they are is regular old cellulose sponges that you can get at the grocery store. Really cheap. I just cut them to size. And I'll even get my little hobby knife or a razor blade and maybe cut, I'll cut little slits about halfway through the thickness. And that'll just allows the tip to, you know, get into those slits and clean it off really, really good on all sides. Now let's start into solder. Don't cheap out on solder. You can have the best soldering equipment and if you cheap out on solder you're going to have a rotten solder job. So don't cheap out on solder. Get good name brand stuff. I am a Kester fanboy. <laughs> Been using it all my life. Um, ever since I learned to solder when I was eight. My dad swore by it and used it in the industry, used it in the trades. Just great stuff. I like uh, the 60-40. This is a leaded solder. 60% tin, 40% lead. I really don't recommend, if you're just starting out, don't use unleaded solder. It's just miserable stuff to work with when you're beginning. It's very susceptible to movement, cold and brittle solder joints. Heat control is more critical with it. This is very forgiving. So stick with a leaded, a good brand name leaded solder. This is rosin core, meaning there's flux built right into the into the uh, solder. Flux is basically an antioxidant. It will clean the parts you're soldering and it also coats the solder puddle from oxidation. You know, you've got a hot metal, it readily oxidizes and the flux keeps that uh, solder from oxidizing. It keeps it flowing and wet. It, uh, you know, think of when it oxidizes, it actually gets a skin on it and it won't flow. It will stick to your gun, just miserable to work with. So that's what the flux is primarily for. This has got it built in. And this specific reel, this is again 6040. There are um, 6337s, uh, so a little bit less lead. A lot of people say they're easier to work with. I honestly don't find a huge difference between either, but I encourage you to try both. You might find the uh, 6337 better. It 
does have a slightly shorter plastic stage, meaning how long it takes it, you know, and the phase where it goes from liquid solder to solid, this is a little bit longer than the 37, uh, the 6337. Try them both, see what you like. The other thing that you'll uh, be looking at with uh, these solders is the thickness. I like a 50,000th of an inch solder, 0 0.05 inches for wiring and connector work. It's a good size for that. Uh, this is a 40 thou. Just a good all round one if you do circuit board work as well and you want to do some wiring. And then there's really fine stuff. Uh, this is a 32 thou. Basically just circuit board stuff. You can certainly use it for wire. You just be feeding a lot more of it in. As you solder, like I said, these have got flux built in. This is actually, this is the Kester 4466. And the 66 just refers to the percentage of flux or rosin and it's 3.3%. When you are soldering, if you apply the heat too long or it's too hot, you can boil that rosin off or that flux. So you often need to add more and you can get it in liquid form. I like this stuff. I just put it in a little eyedropper. It's a little bit thicker so it doesn't boil off as quick. There's the really fine stuff. Um, this is great for PCB work, PCB board work. Um, doesn't leave really any residue, but it flashes off pretty quick. So working time is not that long. And then there are pastes. I've used mine all up. They usually come in a little syringe. They're really nice too. Probably why I've used it up before anything else. And the liquids, you can get these little pens. You can fill them up with the liquid. It's just like a big felt pen that you can apply the, the flux onto your component. As far as any little tools for soldering, wire stripper is pretty much a must. Stripping wire, of course, when you're, that you are going to be soldering. So, good set of wire strippers for all the wire sizing. I like little side cutters too. Little guys like this work great. Most people already have all that. And the only other things left here are the actual solder removal tools. If you ever get into that, if you want to pull solder away from a joint, there's a couple of things. These are really basic ones. Uh, this is a solder sucker. It's just a piston, spring-loaded, and it draws a vacuum and it pulls the pool of solder. So the idea is you heat the solder up, hold this right onto it, and it'll suck up a fair amount but to really to really get all the solder away from a component if you're replacing a component on a circuit board is to use solder wick this is a braided really fine copper braided mesh here it's got a flux built right into it and you heat this up apply it to the circuit board or the component and it will just wick all the solder away and just like solder this stuff if you buy cheap stuff it doesn't work that great so Chemwick is a great name, a uh, great brand uh, from Chemtronics, but uh, there's other good ones as well. So that pretty much covers soldering equipment, and hopefully that uh, goes over everything really broadly and generally, but enough to give you some information. And again, my soldering tool page on my site goes into a lot more depth and detail. Cheers, folks.